Record. All right. All right. Welcome to Homeschool Podcast. A little bonus episode with Corey Michaelis and Andrew Rivers and a special guest, Bart. Uh, shall we use your last name? Bomb <laughs> Shelter Bart? Bart? Bart, last name unknown. Little, uh, <laughs> making you both known associates. He's so. all on Facebook as Bart Stewart, <laughs> uh, Reverend Bart. Reverend Bart, Church of the Divine Annihilation. Be kind to your fellow man or one day you could be annihilated. And uh, yeah. so I have a famous uh, story about meeting a fellow with a bomb shelter. It's one of my dry bar bits. It's got about three million views <laughs> on dry bar down. I'll try not to yell in the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. So uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, we thought uh, end of the world tour, end of the world coming up and uh, well, a crazy couple years here. Yeah. Really uh, we figured we'd get together and... Um, I should point out that in all of his promo material for the end of the world tour, all the uh, artillery and body armor was actually, uh, actually, all that, that whole photo shoot was done in my bomb shelter. Uh, I don't think anyone believes it was my bomb shelter. Yeah. I, don't think that's... <laughs> I don't know, man. Does... I think an AK suits you, man. I really do. Thank Especially you. since he's sporting this uh, Cold War era woodland pattern camouflage right now. <laughs> Absolutely. We gotta... Do you uh, do you have any? Photos of just the uh, artillery and Andrew, uh, no clothes. Uh, uh, is it all? Well, none, none that have been publicly released as yeah. of yet. He, oh, he's we, giving we, it to Vladimir Putin yeah, to we, blackmail me. We refer to that as Biden material. Uh, <laughs> where, you know, like right, right when he takes on his political career or has his first big Netflix special that gets released, and and uh, there's a AK-47 and a oh, OK 4.7 down there. Looks yeah. like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, it's not. Man. That's not okay. <laughs> uh, you know, if, as long as we're talking wit. Wit. You know, <laughs> Damn it. Ballpark, you know? So some uh, women like you, it that wide. Yeah, we are in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. and uh, we mentioned you just graduated from Crane School. Yep. Uh, is that because uh, once everyone blows up all the buildings that uh, you're going to be like, I'm going to be the only one with a job after this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, even post-apocalyptically, you're going to need uh, for, for, for the rebuilding of whatever approximates civilization at that point, you're going to need heavy things lifted. So I, I think there is a certain measure of job security that goes along with that. Primarily, it was just to ensure a uh, decent living and a way to support my gun habit in the meantime. You know. <laughs> Andrew is a graduate of Fraser Crane School. A little different, uh, <laughs> yeah. sort of. Like. Crane School is just these biceps. You're yeah. gonna, you're oh gonna boy! Need to, oh jeez! <laughs> hey, very scary man to hug. Feels like my heart stops every time. Or maybe those are the butterflies. Well, Can a, you reach around him? Can you give him a reach yeah, around? It's, or it's a hug and it's a hug and a chiropractic adjustment. All That's what time. I have to do every day to stay in the bomb shelter. Yeah, That's it. There you go. Um, so. Can we give away the location of the bomb shelter is uh, Eastern Washington, Spokane, Eastern Washington, Idaho yeah, border, Spokane, Idaho border region. Yeah. So who's trying to bomb Spokane? <laughs> well, you know, uh, besides Corey, when he headlines the comedy. Yeah, it would be, uh, <laughs> you know, I want to take that and riff on it comedically. But uh, the actual history, I, in, at least in my opinion, because I'm kind of a Cold War history nut. Um, the actual history of the region is far more interesting. Uh, when the guy built this house, he built it in 1955. And at the time, um, Spokane was, uh, Spokane and the surrounding area was the home of about a dozen Atlas missile silos. Um, not really silos. It was more, um, because the Atlas missiles had to be like raised into position before firing. So it was more like a coffin. I mean, come on, but, we um, all know that. It's but they had, uh, it, it, it was and still is uh, the, the location of Fairchild Air Force Base, which is the headquarters of the air refueling wing, which keeps the B-52s at their fail safe points. They refuel them in the air like 24 hours a day. And at that time, there was also a Nike X anti-ballistic missile site to protect all of that stuff. Um, so at you can that do it. Yeah. Yeah. At that particular point in history, Spokane was a very, very Just hot, very, very hot nuclear yeah. target. And in fact, in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Spokane was the, the keystone operating site because anything south of there, anything to the south and east of there would have overshot Cuba if we actually had to pop some nukes on Cuba. So, um, yeah, they uh, recently had a museum um, exhibition up there where they had one of the actual control panels 
from those Atlas missile silos complete with the little red phone and, and the whole bit. And uh, so wouldn't it just be like further down the list, I guess, is maybe my question. You would have a little. Well, Apple actually, no, no, or, it's uh, well, or do they do they do attacks primary. happen all at once? It, it's still primary. If you look at the different potential scenarios for a, for a nuclear exchange with another superpower, um, say, for instance, Russia at the time or China now, um, the thing with the thing that keeps spokane a primary nuclear target is that air force base the air refueling wing because if you have the bombers holding at their fail safe points and you hit their source of refueling it basically puts you in the position where you either have to use it or lose it mm -hmm. so you either have to commit 100 percent to full-on response or you have to call the bombers back and and you know raise your french flag so um <laughs> so <there's> that <laughs> Because they're cowards. Is yeah, the, is it's the funny because they quit <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, Spokane remains a, a very hot first wave nuclear target. Contrary to popular cinematic misconception, uh, the the first targets that get hit in an exchange like that are military targets. Right. Not you don't get the cities, you don't yeah. get the air bursts over population centers. The first places that get hit are typically tactical ground bursts up to about. 500 kilotons up to a megaton and um they hit ground bursts with that on military installations so that's your first wave so yeah spokane is still a, a pretty hot target you wouldn't you know general layman's terms you wouldn't think of it as a first wave target but yeah definitely is so Corey is a mm. history teacher right mm. uh mm. what uh false mm. information is he giving his students <laughs> was it relatively accurate on the fact check there Corey? that yeah, sounds great <laughs> uh, apparently not that era of history so i mean you know when you have to teach all the way from the uh, renaissance to present day in 180 oh, days yeah. you don't uh, you don't really get too detailed into the tactical stuff of yeah, well, cold wars it's, it's a lot there's a, a lot of specialized historical right. interest there you know there's a lot of kids though that like the most interested high school students are uh, in history are boys who are like Tell me about all the wars. And I'm like, yeah, oh, well, right. I don't, I don't well, know about them. It there seems dangerous. In one of your classes? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you one you can take home with you for, for the students if you get into the era of history. If, I'm if into you it. Wanna, if you want to boil it down to a simple analogy, the, the uh, mentality behind the Cold War and the principle of mutually assured destruction, imagine two kids standing in a bathtub full of gasoline right mm. one of them has six <laughs> matches the so other what kid I off to the, the other kid only has four matches now both of them have more than enough to blow up the place but neither kid is going to feel secure unless he's got more matches there's your cold war so mm. right there oh okay, that's a good analogy all right <laughs> can they when i'm telling this analogy to the class can i make sure to say that they're fully clothed in this bathtub <laughs> and, it uh, probably would oh, be best although frozen. in the state of california they're so lax on pedo bay look at that i'm gonna right screenshot really the freezing hopefully it'll come back <laughs> oh you're back did you hear that you're frozen yeah we're both yeah, frozen he, he, he's under he's unfazed by uh, technical difficulty he just is a wind-up <laughs> toy yeah so it. once you get him on a on a topic uh the, yeah in california one of the babies has to be transgender in yeah, the bathroom yeah, in the bathtub, i think uh, <laughs> baby has to be transgender and the other has to be a uh handicapped person of color oh sorry um differently abled person of color i think <laughs> so Bert's really into pc culture yeah as you of can course tell. <laughs> everyone's delicate sensibilities must be trod upon lightly PCP culture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I have a question. Are, I, I know you've taken some some drugs. What <laughs> is a drug that you would not <laughs> recommend someone experiment with? You're asking me? Yeah. Is there something you've done that you wouldn't recommend? Um, any of the dissociative anesthetics like PCP or ketamine. Um, it's, you know. Which well, too late. Everybody needs a <laughs> hobby, but, you know, that just isn't something that's right up my alley i've uh for those of for um for those of you that follow me on facebook you know i've been off of the hard drugs since april the 12th of 1997 but i'm a big big advocate for uh psychedelics as a, a tool for consciousness expansion i'm of the timothy leary school 
Timothy Leary, Aldous Huxley School, you know, um, set can you put setting. your pupils close to the uh, webcam? Yeah. Let's see what you <laughs> see what you're on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us how to maybe lemur. You, yeah. <laughs> what was your uh, history growing up? Did you torture pigeons in your backyard and capture squirrels? Like, when did you become into? Did you join the military? Did you? You know, how did you become this lifestyle? I, w I was more about torturing cats, uh, okay. actually. That's, oh, that's hey, I'm on board with that. Hands, but... <laughs> <laughs> I cut um, off my cat's leg with a lawnmower accidentally. Yeah. But, uh... With regard to the doomsday prepper stuff, um, again, you know, I was uh, I was a Cold War kid. You know, my high school days were the end of the Reagan era. And at that point, you know, uh, people talk a lot of noise about our foreign policy as regards Russia right now. Um, they have no idea of, of the perception of threat that was alive and well at the time where, you know, we had the crazy cowboy in the White House and we had, you know, the Soviet menace on the other side of the planet. Uh, again, the two kids in a bathtub full of gasoline with their fucking matches. And it was it was a scary time. But the way that I've always dealt with fear in my life is uh, whenever I'm whenever I'm afraid of something. I find that the most effective way to dispel that fear is to research and find out everything that I can about it. And uh, once you become more thoroughly informed, a, a lot of that fear gets alleviated. So it started out as, okay, well, they're telling us that it's going to be a global conflagration and everyone's going to die. And, you know, the few that survive are going to envy the dead, blah, blah, yada, yada. Um, but I started doing a lot of research on the actual effects of, of um, of nuclear weapons, uh, you know, case studies from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, case studies from the downwinders, the Navajo that were living downwind from the Nevada test site, things like that. And then that got me into the works of a gentleman by the name of Mel Tappan. Uh, Mel Tappan had a had a seminal book called Tappan on Survival, and he was pretty much the original doomsday prepper guru. Um, he uh, he didn't cater to the mall ninjas and the armchair commando types. It was just very solid advice. These are the most realistic possibilities. This is what you should be prepared for. Um, you know, of course, I've still got a hard on for the fictional post-apocalyptic Mad Max road warrior shit. But um, when you when you start looking at the more feasible aspects of the way it's probably going to unfold, uh, there are just certain basic things that people can do not to necessarily ensure their survival but definitely to increase their chances and so i got into that you know it's when you're 15 years old and you're reading american survival guide magazine and study hall clearly i didn't get laid until i was about 17 18. um but Ooh, um, early we'll yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. there you go not really a whole Congrats. lot of attention from from the lady folk um so but you yeah, went through I, I yeah. got into it i got really heavily into it and my you know to be fair my parents were not of that mindset and uh i'm, I'm sure both of them thought it was a little odd but my mm. my dad was content to indulge me and just be like okay well then what you know what what can we do to be better prepared as a household well we need to have this put away and we need to have some canned goods and um, of course, by that point, I, I, my interest in firearms was already very well developed from the time I was about probably 11, 12 years old. So, you know, I already had um, what a typical kid in North Carolina would have at the age of 12. You know, I had my little, my little 22s and, and, and whatnot, and suddenly the gun collection got a little bit bigger. So you didn't do any like formal military training no. and then you no, I've, I've, I've never served in the United States military in any capacity. Um, it's odd, though, because having not served and I, I could get into some of the surrounding factors with that, but that's uh, that's another show. Um, There's going to be another show. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, <laughs> sequel. The end of the world <laughs> isn't coming. So, so the end of the world is going to come soon. No, I never, uh, never served in the United States military, but having, having been involved in uh, combatives and martial arts and, and whatnot in one capacity or another since roughly 1989, I actually wound up training with and, and actually training a, a number of folks that have served both the military and law enforcement 
um, one of the one of the guys that I trained with, a very good friend of mine, uh, is a former Russian Spetsnaz officer, or excuse me, former, <laughs> I say officer, I need to be specific about that, that popped up on a thread, uh, but he's a former Russian uh, Spetsnaz operator, oh. um, uh, Sonny Pazik. I was going to correct you, but uh, uh, yeah, show. yeah, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, the the russian training model is is considerably different from the american training model they're more about form follows function and operating with what you have as opposed to the tactical ted more gear is better mentality that kind of pervades the american scene with regard to that stuff so it's interesting so, that in school you were so you were going through all of that cold war fear and there were probably like all sorts of preparations and drills and things that yeah. you needed to do in school. And like when I was in elementary school, we had to swish fluoride once a week. Yeah. I was like, our watch, keep your teeth. And then Andrew learned to stop, drop, and roll. Like that yeah, was, yeah. It was like, oh, we might yeah, catch yeah. on fire. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what's, what? what's interesting about that though, is if, if I don't know, um, I don't know if you guys had to do tornado drills when you were going through school. No, no. Washington so, yeah. That, doesn't really yeah, have to that, do that might have been that. Earthquake. Primarily a Texas thing, but I know yeah, that uh, I know that in Texas we had to do uh, we had to do tornado drills, and you know, and in North Carolina as well. You know, when I was when I was in high school in Carolina, we had to do tornado drills, and it always struck me as funny because these tornado drills had their roots in Cold War duck and cover. Mm -hmm. um and that was funny to me on two levels because you know on the one hand you know it's like we're all going out in the hallway and huddling up against the wall and it's like i felt like the only guy that knew what we were really practicing for um but then also having read the declassified documents on that the whole purpose for getting the kids out into the hallway and having them all stacked up against the wall had nothing to do with their survival survivability it was to facilitate mass burial uh during the recovery period so you could just come in and just bulldoze it all into one mass grave so you know they're all out there huddled <laughs> against the wall going yeah we're gonna survive and i'm like mm, probably not so, <laughs> so that's not uh, that's not yeah. terrifying at all uh <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so you don't necessarily trust the government i guess on uh on on their word here when they when they say maybe uh uh, hide from COVID and uh, uh, this thing is coming to kill you. And there is always, there is always an agenda at work. Um, even with a natural thing, I guess I, I don't know if we want to go down this rabbit hole just yet. We'll, we'll keep it short. Yeah. We'll keep it short on that. We'll, we'll dip our toe into the rabbit hole here. Um, <laughs> the people out there who think that the whole thing is a hoax and that the virus itself doesn't exist and that it, it you know, or, or whatever it, it's, it's beyond ridiculous. And I'm not even going to dignify that with, with addressing it. However, uh, I think it's equally absurd to deny that once this crisis presented itself, that there are unscrupulous elements uh, at the state, local and federal level who, you know, uh, like the old maxim goes, never let a good crisis go to waste. And since this crisis did present itself in the way that it did in the time frame that it did, it has been taken advantage of by those unscrupulous elements and entirely politicized to those ends. Yeah. So it long story, TLDR, uh, <laughs> too long. Didn't read. Someone's always trying to use it. too Fair long. Advantage. Didn't read. Yes. Okay. It's real. And yes, they have blown it out of proportion and politicized it both. And so anyway. when you're shopping for your house and, uh, and <laughs> when you tell the real estate agent, like, Hey, uh, I'm looking for a bomb shelter. <laughs> Does that raise any red flags for them? Or do they go like, uh yeah let me direct you to a different uh fbi agent or whatever it was uh it was interesting the way that came about bomb shelter because... and bay windows please I right really yeah, like yeah. That. and we have both actually we do have a bay window as well um the the realtor knew just from previous snippets of discussions that we'd had that i was a bit of a prepper 
Uh, I mean, I don't get that, that vibe from you. <laughs> yeah, just right. talking to you at all. So I can't imagine. You must have had. You a... walk, if I had a bomb shelter house in my inventory, right? And I met you, I'd be like, that one's not going to work. Let's find him a condo in the city. Andrew's actually <laughs> Andrew's actually been to the place and he's 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 seen it. So the the first time we went through there was this. We had like six houses to look at that day or something, and. And, and uh, this was the second house of the day. And the realtor told me, I have a surprise for you at the second house. And so we get a tour of the place. Of and then, that start and with I'm, already, I'm already digging it, you know, because it's, <laughs> first of all, they have a basement, which is something that we don't have in Texas. Um, and Or at least not in Southeast Texas, we didn't have basements because it's too close to the water table. Um, so I was digging that it had a basement. I was digging that it had a, you know, 1300 square foot steel building garage where I could put my gym and all this other stuff. And I was really enjoying that. And then she said, Hey, that panel of insulation over in the corner in the basement, you know, so it's hidden behind yeah, the wall. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we, uh, so when I checked it out and I, I looked and I, I concrete steps leading down from the basement and I was like, Oh, I like this. <laughs> and then you get to the bottom of the steps and there's this huge concrete, blast proof beveled door that's and it's a 20 by 20 foot you know steel reinforced you know uh concrete bomb shelter I, and we're not talking fallout shelter this thing is like legit blast proof uh shelter and i turn to Up my to what's what's the rating are we is there is it specific? well i mean it's always going to depend on the actual payload of the weapon where and whether it it's an air burst where, yeah, or sure, ground sure. burst and all sorts of things like that but suffice it to say that in any realistic scenario um you're fine including a including a ground burst uh including a ground burst directly on fairchild air force base uh i'm pretty good like it, it's gonna it's gonna level the top side of the house but uh but the basement and the shelter yeah that's the survive. question too is how do you get out from the rubble i've got recovery equipment okay got recovery oh. equipment down there, i was like i got him saws <laughs> like, you're an and idiot. Saws and pickaxes and all kinds of stuff. You got to think these things through. But yeah, Bart's so looking for a bomb to... shelter in the farmland, yeah. and, and Tammy's looking for a condo in the city. <laughs> Fair budget. Around the, around the corner, I check. Around the corner, I see the shelter, and I turn. This week my... on Bomb Shelter Hunters. Sorry. Yeah, okay. My wife at the time, thankfully now ex-wife, uh, I turned <laughs> and I looked at her and I was like, "Well, we're done." She's still alive. Or... Uh, so anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, no, uh, she said, we have four other houses to look at. And I said, no, bitch, you have four other houses to look at. And if one of them has a cooler bomb shelter than this one, we can talk. Uh, in the meantime, I'll be here loading my gear. So. That's great. So she kind of found it. She kind of knew you were a weirdo and was like, Oh, well, she, she knew there was no talking me out of it at that sure. point. So, Oh, the so. price is $1 million. <laughs> uh, well, it looks like we're going to be hitting an armored car. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, uh, that's I mean, fun, so, huh? So I I kept the house in the divorce. We had um, we had the house with the bomb shelter. Was she fighting over the bomb shelter? Uh, no, well, because I <laughs> we had a retreat property uh in a more remote area in that part of the world, and I basically was like, I'll I gave it. her yeah. I gave her the retreat property, and I was like, all right, bitch, you can bug out. I'm gonna bug in. Cool. You know, so. you got you you got the bomb shelter as easily as my wife got her. Cats. It's just like very easy. Yeah. There's no argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah there yours. Please. <laughs> no thanks. Uh, fun. Wow. Well, so then, uh, what is it like? So, I've seen photos, I've seen videos, but what do you got down there in the shelter? What's in it? Um. You I mean, know, it's I, a lot. Of, it's a lot, but uh... I have amassed quite a collection of of preps over the years, and you know, one of the coolest things about having the the shelter outside of the protective aspect is it gives me a place to store all the stuff where it's not going to be cluttering up the basement. <laughs> He's um, got old uh, old uh, boxes of clothes and toys. VHS. Yeah. There you go. VHS there tapes. You go. <laughs> I got a treadmill down there that I hang dirty clothes on. And... That's great. There you go. <laughs> Debbie does Dallas. All right. Yeah. It's, uh, collectors. We, um, it's collectors. You know, I'm, uh, I, I consider, I consider myself a, a, a Rawlsian survivalist, um, which is to say following the, following the, uh, following the works of James Wesley Rawls, who's pretty much the heir apparent to Mel Tappan, who I mentioned earlier. And he's, he's pretty much the guru when it comes to prepper stuff. Um, 
one of his rules is the rule of redundancy and you know two is one and one is none um and beyond having the actual redundancies you need to have um you need to have practical redundancies as well uh two different sources of backup power um you know two to three different sources of water filtration uh, my food storage uh, program is fairly well-rounded, but it's also across the board. I have MREs. I have the freeze-dried stuff. I have regular canned goods. I have, you know, just everything across the board. I've got a... a SpaghettiOs? A, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's sure. why it's the same reason I'm into polygamy. Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, I have a backup. Because two is one. Two is one and one, and is, one none. is none. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, no, so we have the uh, we have all of the food storage down there. There's a, a, a quite a bit of stuff that I've put away myself. Using... Is there a specific event that you're? Because because we talk about the upcoming election and possible right. unrest, and mm -hmm. uh, but that also doubles as just shit's getting crazy. I'm yeah. gonna hide out down here. Right. And by the way, like even if someone accidentally stumbles onto your property, there's a sign uh, that says, "If you can see this, I can shoot you." Yeah, well, there's yeah. There's so a sign it's right not there an the inviting post. neighborhood. You could find that picture on your Instagram page. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think it's, so, it's, yeah. it's a sign. How many football a, fields away is that sign? <laughs> yeah, it's like if if you can read this, our snipers can drop you. Yeah. Is what oh. the sign actually says. But I've you know I've walked it. Um, I've walked it out to the 200 yard mark in every angle that was reasonable to be taking a shot from the rooftop if it came to that so i i can i can i pretty much know if i've got to range somebody in it and it's really gone tits up like that i know that if they're at this telephone pole that i need to dial it in for 100 yards or you know whatever um there's one time i was at your house and uh, we were bombing uh i don't remember exactly what trump was bombing somebody syria and it was like hey thank god i'm here tonight but yeah. uh <laughs> But so are you are you just kind of prepared for a well-rounded thing or or like just bad scenarios in general? That it's when people did you have plenty of toilet paper? It's, <laughs> yeah, more than enough. Yeah. More than enough. I you know already had cases of it put back, you know, so I didn't have to I didn't have to worry about any of the panic buying, which is, you know, again, what you're essentially buying is you're buying peace of mind. Right. I mean, even if nothing happens or even if what you had expected to happen doesn't transpire the way you thought it did, again, I, I managed to avoid all the chaos and the panic buying. Uh, now, you know, when he did get a bidet, but uh, that's just for <laughs> <Yeah>. fun. <laughs> did you watch my podcast with my dad? They, I was no, talking about no. uh, I won't last in the apocalypse because I, I, I'll miss my bidet. There's no <laughs> bidet spray bomb bottle. shelter. Yeah. Spray yeah. bottle. Okay. Mm. Spray so on, on the toilet paper, this was what I was leading up to is that uh is that like one ply or two ply like how do you splurge <laughs> where did you decide um typically bought by the case so i had two full cases put away i bought two that, is uh, one and one is zero, two is one and one know. is none um, spaghetti has give me diarrhea so that's right, gonna be a problem right. <laughs> ah, you know, we have like a we have a restaurant supply uh <laughs> restaurant supply store like right up the street so uh you know i was able to to procure the you know and it's the stuff that you'll find in any sure. restaurant restroom you know not the most comfortable but yeah, you know it gets the job done uh, but at the end of the day man newspapers are still what 50 cents so i mean sure. if, you, if you seriously get pinched um what's a newspaper but no i mean it, beyond beyond the toilet paper thing you know I've, they've gone back and forth on the efficacy of masks and whatnot but i've, I've got a sure. substantial supply of the n95 respirator mm -hmm. mass mm -hmm. um one of the gas masks that you see andrew pictured in um on the instagram page uh is a, a copy of the old uh the older united states uh issue military issue gas mask which the filters on that are useless against like modern nerve agents like sarin or vx but for any biological uh contaminant they're perfect i mean all the way up through whatever covid anthrax you know ebola um so again will you fly with one of those please andrew <laughs> <laughs> I would love to that see that really actually. Great, actually. Yeah, yeah. Know, what I mean, what are they going to do? Kick you off the flight? Have you seen the new things they're advertising yeah, exactly. on like, Twitter okay. and Facebook? They're mm -hmm. like, I mean, I don't know. Sort of spacesuit y. Oh, oh wow. God. Yeah. I've really? Seen those. And they have like a filter in the back or whatever. Yeah. Seriously, the minute, the minute Fauci started talking about goggles, <laughs> the minute Fauci started talking about goggles, I was like, oh, 
get fucked. <laughs> I, I was just like, you know, it, I, seriously. Goggles and a nose plug. <laughs> I understand. Shower if cap. Wanna, <laughs> if you want to wear a mask because you're either convinced that it's the threat they're making it out to be, or you're just so eager to signal your virtue and willingness to comply with government dictates, whatever, whatever reason you want to wear a mask, fine. You start slapping on goggles and face <laughs> shields. And now these new fucking hazmat suits that they, it's like, dude, you're dead to me. You're fucking dead to me. You know, I, it's one thing if we fuck Andy Reid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one of the scenarios that we were talking about earlier, you know, when Andrew was asking me, like, what, what are you, you know, like, what are you prepared for? Well, yeah. try to be for damn near anything. But let's say it was a real severe pandemic, not this prison bitch of a pandemic that we got going on right now. What's uh? so if we're at what are we at? Like, say like an air, say we ran up on an airborne Phylovirus, like an airborne strain of Marburg or Lassa fever or Ebola or any of the any of the hemorrhagic fevers that are that are bloodborne contagions. If we wound up with if we wound up fighting an airborne strain of a contagion like that, you would see me, you know, lock stepping with the mask and, and the respirator and all of the you know decontamination Wouldn't it protocols feel like, and everything. Uh, one of those tiny things is a little bit uh uh not as effective at that point though what with regard to with like a more serious virus um again depends on uh depends on method of transmission depends on virulence of the particular strain for instance let's say we wound up with my my dream Green virus, uh, you know, like a, an airborne, <laughs> an airborne strain of Marburg. I've been living for this. Um, yeah. Well, your birthday candles. If it's um, not with this mask. If if it's transmitted through the air, right? Not droplets, but actually airborne versus droplets. Um, then yeah, you're just walking around with a mask and no eye protection, things like that is not going to help you. Um, but that one mask that i had you try on it's got full face protection i see everything. so you would be wearing so. that in fred meyer you know, <laughs> oh yeah suit. yeah stepping over mountains <laughs> with of, your ghillie suit stepping over mountains dead of bodies switching bodies that are <laughs> you know still frothing around in their own filth and bleeding from their eye sockets so yeah so what's a more real what's the most realistic situation that you think you'll will happen say your lifetime our lifetime like, is it a virus thing? Is it is it something like this getting way worse? Is it civil unrest? Is it a bombing thing? Is it uh, uh, what kind of disasters? A zombies <laughs> realistic? But what are you? Uh, I mean, what are you hoping for? <laughs> we got the final virus, <laughs> and then what? Uh, what do you think is more likely to happen? With regard to the current political. Um chaos just because that's the most obvious right, right. Now. Yeah. um zombies i was hoping for but but again you you have a you have a potential for it, it's a principle that i refer to as a, a convergence of crises right uh right where you have one it's not just one thing. one crisis oh, yeah. that opens it up to another crisis let's say for instance, uh, civil unrest gets completely out of hand. So, like, just uh, the smallest thing inconveniencing the country and Trump as president. Yeah, <laughs> just like two horrible things <laughs> at a bad time. Yeah. Oh God, you so <laughs> badly want me to go down that rabbit hole. We'll don't get you? there in a minute. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll get there yeah. eventually. But le I mean, for instance, coming up in November, it really doesn't matter. It really does not matter who wins or by what margin, you're still going to have a greater or lesser degree of violence and civil unrest. Let's say that as a result of that violence and civil unrest, one party or the other decides to lock everything down. Well, then you've locked everything down, so we've got a further drag on the economy. Once we get a further drag on the economy, you have more people out of work, more people starving, more people getting desperate, which does what to the level of violence increases the number of people participating and increases the the links to which they will go uh you know because when you have a 
you know, your little five-year-old daughter tugging on your pant leg going, daddy, why does my tummy hurt? And you know that the answer is because you haven't eaten in four days. You know, suddenly the neighbor that you were cool with, you know, for the last 12 years that, you know, has a bomb shelter and food and whatnot suddenly becomes not so your favorite neighbor for the same reasons anymore. Would you eat your neighbor? Absolutely. <laughs> Which one of your kids would you eat first? <laughs> what kids do you have? I have uh, I have one biological daughter. OK. And uh, I have I have uh, three stepchildren. So the three step kids, um, obviously. Yeah, yeah, three step children. Um, as to which one I would eat first, and that was one of the things that your boy Titus uh, has a, a bit about. If you have not seriously contemplated which which of your children you're going to eat first in the event of Armageddon, you can't. You're not a real call yourself parent. a survivalist, right? Um, I have determined which one that I would eat first. I'm not about to go public with that okay. because of the backlash. <laughs> That sure. is going to happen once Cancel I get home. Cancel culture going to come for you. Uh, it, well, not so much that. Not <laughs> so much know. that as the wife. You oh, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, The wife will definitely cancel my ass for that. <laughs> um, but, yes, I have contemplated and I have come to a conclusion on that. Um, hmm. like again, the, you know, you might have had you might have had a fantastic friendship relationship with your neighbors up until that point. And you, and under normal conditions, it's the easiest thing in the world to be civil even with people that you don't necessarily like but even people that you do like that you're cool with if it's the choice i mean don't get me wrong Corey. you know we've 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 hung out a we've hung out a few times and uh i think you're a class act i think you're a great human being uh however the choice <laughs> yeah give it get, get, give given the choice between uh between letting my kids starve to death or stabbing you in the neck Sorry, you know, nothing personal. <laughs> and 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 here's the thing, Corey, when I say this, I would fully expect you to hold to the same standard. You know, mm -hmm. that is your I don't wife even have any or kids. child oh, okay. or parent <laughs> or whatever. I mean, yeah. I, I would fully expect you to to get with Andrew and coordinate, you know, waiting until I go to sleep and then, you know. I think our best chance of survival is keeping you alive. <laughs> <laughs> It's the added benefit of being everyone's prepper friend. It's like, you know, if Bart, hey Bart dies, will you stab that guy for me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm hungry. But then there's the, you know, there's the backside of that, which is that, that old oh, t-shirt. Oh. It's that old t-shirt that says, if you die first, we're splitting up your gear. Uh, so, uh, yeah. you know, maybe I'm the first one on the roster to go. Who knows? Just, well, you are a little, we wouldn't know how to, we wouldn't know how yeah. to use any of it. We did shoot yeah. guns recently though. We did go uh, to a gun range. You saw, yeah. I would love. I heard about that. A critique of our tech. Did you see the video or the pictures? I, I have happened? not gotten a chance to see the video. Oh, yet. Okay. All right. Okay. But here's what I'm going to suggest. Having not seen the video, <laughs> um, I'm going to suggest that your performance was probably less than stellar. And I'm going to strongly suggest that uh, when I make it back up to the Northwest, that you guys uh, come over the pass and see me. Um, we will do it go for out real. To the, we will go out to the undisclosed location that uh, that Andrew worked into his bit. And, you know, we'll run through all the artillery. When you go to uh, bed at night, how close to you is a gun? Uh... <laughs> Depends on or... where I'm sleeping and who I'm sleeping with. Okay. Um, so tonight with Andrew. <laughs> and, right, right. So um, inside, of, inside, inside of Andrew. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> In fact, maybe that's where I'll hide the gun. Mm. <laughs> oh. 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 Anyway, okay. uh, sorry. Didn't, it was, didn't know it was that kind of party. Okay. Um, I think uh, Shane Moss's joke was, uh, don't get a gun, get a grenade. Just hear some footsteps. You crack the, the door. Roll, roll that it out. Sucker out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. Under typical circumstances at home, um, uh -huh. yeah. and when I'm on the road, when I'm on the road, it's a different ball game altogether. Uh, generally, I don't sleep more than arm's reach away from whatever weapon. Your um, bed frame is made out of rifles. <laughs> yeah. At the house, uh, at the house, I have my uh, my bedside gun, uh, Bridget, uh, second generation Glock Model 20, full power 10 millimeter, uh, running 185 grain Buffalo bore hollow points. It's a really big ass kicker of a round. Um, that's what sits on the bedside table. What's uh, loaded and chambered that runs sort of in line with the bed post is Master Blaster. 
and that's uh, my uh, Remington 1187 12-gauge semi-automatic uh, loaded with double on buck. Also, yeah. the nickname of my penis. Oh, really? Yeah, my, yeah. I refer to mine as I refer to mine as Zod the Impaler. Um, yeah, mine's a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> but but again, you know, there's there's the, um, the kind of take the I got I need a pill to get the gun off safety. But there, there's, it's really good. <laughs> I mean, there's factors to take into consideration. If I'm uh, if I'm staying by myself in the house, uh, it's like what Andrew was just saying for for indoors. If you're particularly in an apartment, shotgun is ideal. Um, 12 gauge shotgun is ideal. And I would recommend under typical circumstances, uh, that it be loaded with number four buckshot, which is smaller pellets, greater number of smaller pellets. The reason for that is Andrew and I were having this discussion before we got on, we're having a discussion on terminal ballistics and the way that energy from projectiles transfers into targets. If you have a shotgun, uh, and you, you take that shot up close. It's a direct, you know, direct shot into flesh, making contact with the target. If you're running into 12 gauge loaded with number four and you make contact, it's still definitely taking your would be assailant out of the fight. If for whatever reason, your trigger discipline sucks and you wind up putting that round through a fucking wall and you have roommates, children, whatever in the next room, if you're running a handgun round or even worse, a rifle round, uh, chances are that projectile is going to penetrate, you know, straight through however many layers of sheetrock and two by fours and what the fuck ever do you have and roommates? stands the no, I do not. Okay. Uh, it stands the <laughs> room it, for rent on right, Craigslist. It, yeah, <laughs> it stands the potential to do some damage to people that you didn't want to damage. Now with the shotgun, it's still got just as much power with that straight straightaway shot, but because those pellets are small and numerous, they lose their muzzle energy very, very quickly on contact with anything in flight. So whereas a rifle round or a handgun round may penetrate straight through and kill somebody two rooms over because there's not enough mass to take that kinetic energy energy out of the projectiles and is still carrying enough power to kill somebody that far over whereas with the shotgun that first layer of sheetrock is going to take a hell of a lot of sting out it dissipates the energy very very quickly because we're dealing with small pellets that are widely spread out so that energy dissipates in the first layer of sheetrock and then through the insulation and then the back layer of sheetrock by the time it gets into the next room uh, it's still it's still got enough energy to potentially do some damage but the likelihood of killing someone on the far side of that wall is is very very limited so it's just different factors to take into consideration i doubt hmm. that i would i mean i wouldn't be i doubt that i get the death penalty have you in a been case like that arrested have you been are you allowed to vote <laughs> are you allowed to have guns i, I am a, i am allowed to both uh, i'm allowed to both vote and possess firearms i That's have great. i've uh never been convicted of a felony um yeah right <laughs> never been convicted of a felony um that wasn't the table that was andrew's bazooka was right like, right that was his bazooka <laughs> tapping on no i um i have a class a misdemeanor uh i have a class a misdemeanor uh, assault with grievous bodily injury that's, they actually use the word grievous. It's right there in the warrant. But assault with grievous bodily injury dating back to 1996. And that is the closest um, to being a prohibitive uh, criminal sentence that I've ever been involved with. And in fact, I had a bit of a legal hiccup um, a couple of years ago over that very thing because in the state of Washington, that um, class A misdemeanor counts as a felony for purposes of firearms transactions. So I had to go in and go through all the legal paperwork to say, hey, this conviction is for a misdemeanor and it dates back to 1996 and I need to have my gun rights restored in the state of Washington. And after several thousand dollars and, and a whole lot of headaches, um, was finally able to get those rights restored. But, um, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, there you go. gun rights. 
since we're sort of touching on that. Don't let him forget about Breonna Taylor, Corey. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I we'll get into uh, all this defund the police. Sure and, uh, making sure we're I all mean, on I the think same page. Interesting takes. On- <laughs> I got it. I'm I mean, ready. Um, I mean, I guess this is, I mean, this is obviously sort of the lead into that is that, right. you know, I think where we agree a lot is that there needs to be more personal responsibility. Absolutely. Uh, sort of entrusted in or expected. I don't know, but I don't know how you get around to that. Like, how do you force people? But so they, so is Washington passing new laws that is saying like, if you have somewhat violent misdemeanors, we're going to take away guns now is that what no that's um that's been a long-standing um that's been a long-standing law in the state of washington and i wasn't aware that that was the law in the state of washington uh moving up from texas and what had happened was i was going through a, a really nasty divorce and divorces are expensive do you want to know why divorces are expensive because they're worth it anyway uh so i'm going through this uh nasty and expensive divorce get what you pay for yeah. <laughs> Corey, uh, you got a comment? Right. <laughs> He's divorced. But I luckily going, was made money online. So guns are going in right. and out of the pawn shop. <laughs> Several times they were in and out of the pawn shop, and it never raised any flags about that. Um, under federal law, under federal law, the only thing that the only uh, crimes that f- prevent you from legally buying a weapon or any felony, right? Any felony, the only misdemeanor law that prevents you from purchasing a weapon is domestic violence right you have when you go in for when you go in for any firearms transaction there is a background check that gun show loophole non-existent absolutely fucking non-existent all it, it is it is essentially no different from me selling you a car if i own it right uh you are going to do the proper legwork to make sure that that car isn't stolen is there a gun fax uh, <laughs> actually there is actually there is there's a not a not a you know in the same sense as car fax but sure. with regard to background checks you can you can have a you can have the serial number traced and and uh the person so that is that on the person from. buying it it's not through any government system is what is that the the person Give me a scenario. So the, so I'm buying a car from you, right? Mm-hmm. And I download a Carfax and blah, blah, blah. But I don't have to tell the government, like, hey, this was uh, previously owned by this guy and he crashed it or whatever. That's not government no. record. No. So no. when I buy a gun from you, <clears throat> same analogy, right? You're, I, I, it's on me to look that up? Is it, that what you're saying? It is, but it isn't. Say, for instance, say, for instance, you have a... a but I don't let's, have to call the government. Let's not even let's okay. not even make it an assault a weapon. Let's yeah, not even yeah. make it an assault weapon and complicated. Sure, let's let's say it's just a regular, you yeah. know, you know, grandpa's old hunting shotgun. Whatever. Yeah, that can't it's assault people. people. Yeah, I got you. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, but I'm buying, soft- a, I'm buying a 12 gauge shotgun. For it's you. not. It's not baseball. It's softball. <laughs> yeah, it's softball. It's yeah, very it's soft. A, it's a yeah. That's blood like. Ah, it still hurt. <laughs> That's a serious head wound, what, as opposed to a whimsical head wound. <laughs> but, um, so Andrew wants to sell me his shotgun, right? Uh-huh. And, you know, we make contact online, whatever. Um, and I say, I'd like to buy your shotgun. And he says, sure, I'd be happy to sell to you. Now, it's private property in most states, not in Washington state, but in most states, it's just like any other transaction. If Andrew is smart, I blow you behind the Seven Eleven. If Andrew <laughs> is smart, what he is going to do is say, especially a guy that looks like me. I'm showing up. I'm big. I'm tatted up, shaved head, the whole bit, looking a little rough around the edges. A three um, percenter hoodie. Yeah, th- yeah, three percenter <laughs> hoodie. It's like this is the kind of thing where he's probably because if he sells to me and it does turn out that I'm a convicted felon, there there are legal re- repercussions for him, right? So if he is, even though it's not required, if he's smart, what he's going to do is say, hey, let's walk down here to the pawn shop or the gun store or Cabela's or anybody who's got access to what's called the Nix system um, to run a quick background check. And what will happen is it'll come back one of three ways, right? It'll come back one of three ways. It'll either say approved or proceed where that means that I don't have any felonies, don't have any domestics, whatever. And he can sell it to me directly. Then we have the other end of the spectrum where it it says delayed 
right? Which means, hey, there are some things here and we need to do a little more digging. For instance, uh, we just saw a photo of him. We're going to need more time. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> There's some stuff we don't know. It could be as easy this as is, that. Uh, this is obviously incorrect. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and then there's the third scenario, which is outright denied, right? Uh, if they, if you do that, if you do that check and it says delayed, and, and this was something that I was used to because I do have a misdemeanor assault conviction. So they go to run the next check. It pops up. Here's an assault. Well, it's a misdemeanor assault. So I'm not immediately disqualified. You barely hurt the guy. But it's now not a big deal. they've got to dig a little deeper because if that misdemeanor is connected to domestic violence, I'm still forbidden, right? Mm -hmm. So they can hold it up to five business days, right? And they can say, hey, listen, you know, and if they don't find it, if they don't find anything in five business days, transaction proceeds. Are you so, okay with those laws? Do you think they should be less? Do you think they should be different or more specific or or i think specificity counts right. a lot i think specificity counts a lot i i am not opposed in any way shape or form to universal background checks in fact i'm so not opposed that i'll be the first to point out that we already have universal background checks right um if you buy a gun, even even at a gun show, the much vaunted gun show loophole, bum bum ba, big dramatic music. Da, 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 da. Um, if if you buy a gun at if you buy a gun at a gun show, almost without exception, every table at that gun show is going to be a dealer with a with an FFL, a federal firearms license. Because he is an FFL dealer, he is required by law to run that background check. He said almost every dealer. Almost, and I'm getting to that. Okay. I'm getting to the exceptions. Is that the loophole? <laughs> it's what's referred Trigger. to. No, no, not at all. Yeah, it, it's, it's what's referred to as a loophole. Okay. Gotcha, yeah. Now, let's say I'm looking around and I'm shady guy. Well, no, I'm not even shady guy. I'm just regular Elmer Fudd. And I'm looking for a hunt and shot. I wouldn't want him to have a gun. To me. Right. <laughs> I've seen what he can do with it. Be his... very quiet. He's not that. <laughs> he's not that trained. <laughs> Nobody um, should have a gun if they can't say they're Oz. <laughs> you will have. You will have tables. You will have one or two tables, and they're usually off in the back corner. That's marked private sale. Again, almost without exception. The guys that are doing private sales, they're selling off their personal collection or whatever. They're cleaning out their gun safe. They've got 27 guns and they have 16 of them that they haven't fired since the Nixon administration. And they're getting rid of, them, right? They're selling these. They're not asking much for them. Uh, there's no background check required. It's not, it's not legally required for them to do a background check. As a general rule, almost everyone does because you're at a gun show. And particularly if you've got a guy that even looks remotely shady, right? They're not going to sell. They're not going to sell because they know, even as a private individual, FFL dealer or but where not. is that record of that sale? If it, they don't have to do a background check at the gun show, do they give you a receipt and they take your name you've got, down? You've got your bill of sale. And a lot of those guys will write down the name and the driver's license number. They'll say, Hey, so then if you go and commit a crime and right. then they, they cover the and gun, the reason they look at the driver's license is because under federal law, regardless of the background checks, and all the other stuff under federal law, you can't sell to a person who's from out of state. From another state than, okay. than where the transaction is taking place so they're at least going to write down the driver's license number and and just be like hey i sold this gun to this person on this date so if it does come back to them right so then you can't so you can get it without a background check it is possible to do so it is possible to do so yes but okay. if you look at it highly unlikely if you look at it statistically this is not what people do the way the way that the the narrative is presented in the media is that terrorists and violent criminal gang bangers and all this other stuff are just prowling around at gun shows looking for that guy to do a private sale why would they if, go why would yeah. they go if they're if their intent is criminal why would you go into first of all a building that's that's guarded by law enforcement because there's sure. always cops on the ground you have 
a, you have a group of people there that are very law and order minded. Right. Right. I can tell you from working Love that show. A, a, a number, a, a number of tables. Yeah. A number <laughs> of tables and a number of, of, of gun shows over the years uh, with people that I've been associated with. I can tell you, man, they police their own when yeah, it comes to that. For sure. If you've got a guy who's obviously there's a, there's a thing called a straw man purchase. And again, why would you seek out a private dealer if you can do a straw man purchase? Right. Um, do you remember G. Gordon Liddy? G. Gordon Liddy was one of the pivotal figures in the Watergate scandal, and was a convicted the history teacher, right? Was, was and he was a convicted mm -hmm. felon. He was also a radio talk show host for a while, and any number of times on the air, he said, oh, "Well, you know, as a as a criminal, as, as a convicted felon, as a convicted felon, I am prohibited from owning any weapons. My wife, however, has a very extensive collection. You know, this is what's referred to as a straw purchase." You okay. get someone to buy for you, right? It's far easier for someone who is part of the criminal element to find someone with a clean record to go buy a weapon for them if they can't procure it themselves. Yeah, I guess my also thought is like, how do you know that's going to be the guy who's not going to do background? Okay. Is that word getting around? Is I'm that... good. Thank you. Sorry. Generally, no, you don't know. I, and they don't. They might say so if you if you wanted a gun and you have a bad they may record, say private sale right they might say private sale but on the table a... but they're not doing a big flag up there going hey no background checks sure, sure. because generally what's going to happen there before anybody could even make a move you're going to have the six tables next to them going dude you're a dick yeah you're a dick and you're making us look bad yeah, yeah. and get the fuck out of here with they that also noise. don't want that attention yeah dude I, I you know and i've seen it happen more times than i can count where you've got guys that are shady and it's obvious they're they're walking around a gun show you know you got the guy with the with the bling and the you know just looking every bit the part and he's walking around with a clean cut looking chick or you know another dude who's dressed well these two people do not look like they showed up together but they're prowling and you see them talking and then they move apart and then you know they come back and they're talking and clean cut guy goes to another table and he's talking prices and they're talking again when dealers see that at gun shows word travels quicker than the freaking internet yeah the word gets out it's like hey dude the the shady guy with the bling he's trying to do a straw purchase with this other asshole don't sell to him and seriously they they the, those seriously the, the the ffl dealers in particular because there are nine miles of hoops that you've got to jump through to get that fucking license yeah so they're definitely covering their own ass hmm. um hmm. So that's right. that's the thing with the gun show loophole. What was the thing that led us into that question before we got into gun show? Um, that was just kind of a general uh, law and order, uh, uh, gen general discussion. Specificity of law. Sure. law. Specificity yeah. of law. If there were, if there were, because people always ask me, you know, and I'm, we could get into the debate. What about are some effective laws? What, or what, what the yeah. Second Amendment actually says, and how it should be put into practice, and what the founders intended, and things like that. One that I do want to address right off the bat, and just shut it down. This whole thing that the founders could not have anticipated the kind of firepower that we have available right now, and their intent was for it to be a militia and not for an individual right. First of all, if you read the actual letters of the founders to each other, it could not be more clear that it was specifically intended as a constitutional right for the individual. It's in all of their private correspondences between, between themselves, the record is long. But more to the point, the founders could not have anticipated this kind of firepower. Absolute bullshit argument, and I'll tell you why. Most of the artillery pieces, artillery that was fielded by the colonial militia were privately owned, privately owned. So you're going to tell me with a straight face that the founders would be completely okay with you having a cannon to roll around to blow up your neighbor's house or your neighbor's car, but that somehow repeating firearms would have given them fits. I'm not buying it. I'm just not buying it. And I think the the commentary in their own personal correspondences would bear that out. Washington was clear about it. Jefferson was clear about it. And in some cases, so clear that there's just there's no room for hashtag intellectual gymnastics. There's there's no room even for that. The great object is that every man be armed. Jefferson, 
you know, uh, why, uh, Jefferson, and Jefferson, and, Jefferson and Washington, no free man shall be debarred the use of arms. Nothing complicated about that statement. Nothing ambiguous about that statement. Hmm. It was clearly intended to be for the rights of an individual. So um, with regard to laws that I would support, first of all, I, I'm an, on a personal level, on a personal level, just like with the First Amendment, I am an absolutist about the Second Amendment. And when I say absolutist, I, I fucking mean that. Lock, stock, and barrel, pardon the pun. I absolutely mean that. Do Some I feel sirens like going on? They, yeah, yeah, exactly. They, 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 try, they must be listening. Line? In. Did we, yeah. did we... Is this thing? <laughs> the chair is against the wall. Bob has a long mustache. Extraction, extraction. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm an absolutist when it comes to the Second Amendment. Does that mean that I think people should be able to own belt-fed machine guns? Absolutely. Do uh, do, do I you think I should own a machine gun? Should you or should you be able to? <laughs> yeah, I should be able to. I probably shouldn't. Well, only because you haven't trained properly. With okay. It. Um, but the fact of the matter is we can legally own machine guns in the United States. We can. Is there a situation where a machine gun would become necessary in, in my life? I mean, that's what I, I guess I can understand that they're fun. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, again, th then we got to get into specificity of definition. Are, are we talking about when we're talking machine gun? Are we talking like the true nature of a machine gun as in belt fed right. crew serve weapon? Are we talking about submachine guns, you know, pistol caliber carbines that are capable like you're of for, You're fire. like for all. All yeah, of it. Yeah, okay. Every right. last every last bit of it without exception. Should I be, here's, should here's I have a, grenades? Here, What's the limit? Here's, here's okay. another, here, and I'll address the grenade and flamethrower question in a minute. <laughs> flamethrower. Um, yeah, Elon, did you get an Elon Musk could, flamethrower? Because you knew what was going there. I haven't yet, but it's it's definitely <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the, it's on the Christmas list. list. <laughs> um, Go check out Bart's Amazon wish list. You can Amazon.com slash Reverend Bart. You can actually own fully automatic weapons legally in the United States. A lot of people, you know, that's the first thing. Well, you know, machine guns are banned. No, they're not uh, there. Now you've got to jump through some pretty substantial, you know, legislative hoops, not legislative hoops, but uh, judicial hoops to get there. Right. Um, but let's say I wanted to buy one of those belt fed crew serve weapons we were just talking about. Let's say something that everybody would recognize if you've seen the first blood series, if you've seen Rambo one or two, that big belt fed uh, M60. Uh, you can find those. They are prohibitively expensive and you can buy them. There is a $200 tax stamp that is required to be paid to uh, the BATF for each weapon then uh there's also an additional licensing process where you have to get a class three weapons license and class three weapons license will enable you to uh will enable you to own machine guns flamethrowers hand grenades uh and and some of these other things so it's possible to do it legally it's entirely possible to do it. But I mean, you know, why go through all that when you can just when you can just buy a heater with seven bodies on it off the street for nothing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the point with laws. They only apply to the law abiding. And this is this is the problem. Even if we get rid of uh, guns, only criminals will have guns. Well, I mean. For instance, the point that I was just making, uh, you can own machine guns legally right. in the United States, right? Um, since that kicked into gear with uh, originally the 1934 Gangster Weapons Act was when they were first prohibited and placed in a different category of weapons. Up until 1934, you could walk into a hardware store and buy a Tommy gun. You know, it was, it was right there. Up until 1968, you could buy semi-automatic military-style rifles through the mail up until 1968. Um since 1934 take a wild guess at how many legally owned fully automatic weapons have been used in the commission of violent felonies since 1934 take a wild guess oh man um zero 
Well, good guess, Corey. I knew that's what he was aiming for. But uh, what about the Las Vegas uh, guy uh, with the those were first of all, those first of all, all of those were purchased legally, but they were not fully automatic weapons. They were semi modified with a bump stock that were modified with a bump stock and they got rid of bump stocks, you know. Okay, you know, if that makes you feel better. Isn't it much easier, though, for uh, the party that is conservative, which means keep things the way they are, Mm -hmm. than it is for a party that is progressive, which would be to make changes in advancement of society to be an absolutist or an original intent? Judicial, you know, like why if that's if the point of the party essentially, supposedly is to be progressive or to be uh, which is questionable, but uh, right. encouraging change, adding, you know, new amendments maybe to the Constitution right, right. to improve, then, I mean, isn't it much, much, hey, I'm an original intent person. I just like how it was, like when it said that black people weren't people. I just, it's so much easier. <laughs> See, and that, I, mean, that yeah, seems... I knew that was eventually going to get thrown out, that little. But that I just mean, hard... well, it immediately got changed right after this war and right. uh, whatever. But, but... All, all of all of those things, though, Corey, all of those things have been advancements that we have made that went through the proper process. OK, the, the founders, the founders left a process in place for. And once again, I've dropped my earpiece. Um. <laughs> This is like the prison equivalent of dropping the soap. I mean, Get him. I drop my earpiece, little man. Uh, there was a process put in place for all of these things to be changed. It wasn't laid down in stone as documents that were never intended to be fucked with. Okay. But, but, but the, not by the Supreme Court to be changing. No, not or, even uh, that. Yeah. Not even that. Yeah. The process was put in place to where if changes were to be made, It had to be a change that was that the idea was strong enough on its own merit that it could survive the complications of the process. For instance, needing two thirds of the state, you know, uh, of the, the individual states to approve something to make it a constitutional amendment. It's it's difficult. Right. It's it's a very difficult process because it's supposed to be. That's why it's only been done, you know, 26, 27 times right. in, in nearly 250 years of our history. Right. And almost without exception, every one of those amendments has, has been stellar. You know, that little prohibition thing didn't work out so well. Um, but even then, it was quickly repealed. You know, uh-huh. you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, th- we so have in the span of, of a lifetime of a country, mm-hmm. four years of prohibition. Yeah, yeah, it's a we, blip. Yeah, a it's tiny. a blip. Yeah, I mean it's a but horrible it's such blip. A, yeah, but it's such a thing in the moment that we're like four years yeah. of prohibition, four years yeah. of Trump. It's a blip. Yeah, yeah, it's a tiny a blip. <laughs> what damage could it do? <laughs> well, it really, you know, getting it's back to that. It's a couple years of slavery. Get over it. We'll figure out the law in a few years. Just you know, yeah. come on. Well, well that's a So then we need so a process. Trump was, <laughs> well, yeah, but you know what? Ultimately, ultimately, the process sort of had a little hiccup, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans and damn near the the dissolution of of the union. We we nearly lost the we nearly lost the COVID? national integrity <laughs> over that. Uh, we're we're talking about you know that's clever. Um, <laughs> He's like stone. You can't even get but, him. But we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people dying. We're you know we fought a civil fucking war over this thing, and then once it was all over with, we went, "Wow, that was really fucking horrible." We need to do the right thing here, and very very quickly, these things got these things got pushed through. The problem with simplifying the process particularly in an age where everything is so partisan now and everything is so polarized now. When you simplify the process, all it takes is the wrong motherfucker or the wrong motherfucker's team to seize power and suddenly everything can turn on a dime. So everything thing to turn on a dime at least in my lifetime that i've been paying attention it's felt like every 
Thursday. election, right? I mean, like literally every person at every point is the wrong motherfucker. I mean, the, the things that pe- the yes, right? Yes, the Actually, things that we said would happen if George Bush was elected, the things a, we said would happen if Al Gore was elected. It's a very astute observation. When man. when do we tone the rhetoric down? How do we get the rhetoric back to, you know? the truth when when do we uh is that lost is that we, over we may be too far gone yeah it's entirely possible that we are too far gone at this point because again is there going to be a, a media network in the future the, that the, the is going to be nonpartisan? somewhat good luck with that yeah uh the problem is even with the, uh, the, the new most, yorker yeah, even even uh, the post. Yeah, e- yeah. Even even with the most nonpartisan air quotes, even with the most uh, even with the most nonpartisan network, you still require, in the same way that the strength of our constitutional republic requires, an educated electorate that is capable of critical thinking, and that is something that we left behind long, long ago. And so more money for education in schools. Well, or something. More Pay money. Pay me for, more. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, right. No you kidding. Know what I, I as like, much as I love yeah. you, Corey. As much as I love you, uh, the Yikes. the thought of pouring more money into government schools, public education. Buttigieg prom- promoted an uh, interesting idea of some some kind of civil service, whether that not necessarily be through army or military but maybe you uh, understood no uh, I'm, I'm, my parents made me go to like a nursing home to get credits for college or whatever you know i think i, I think that's a fantastic idea but again getting back to the the issue at hand which is educating the electorate understand the second part of my statement it's got to be an educated electorate with the power of critical thinking and we, we no longer have anything even approximating that. In fact, critical thinking skills are actively discouraged. We are not instructed in... Not in the proper, public high schools we, I taught in, but... Well, possibly you've or, had... You know, possibly you've had a great or districts. deal of luck. Yeah, know? I mean, it was, the most, it was the biggest, most highest paid district in the uh, state of Washington, and it was paramount to what right. we taught at every in every Good. subject at every level is critical Good. thinking school. And 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 I believe that's I believe that's fantastic. Uh I I also believe that it I also believe that the examples that are floated of public schools being I don't want to I don't want to get hyperbolic and refer to them as indoctrination centers and things like that and you know we're not at the level of we you know we're not at the la- level of Al's great great leap forward yet, mm-hmm. um, only because AOC isn't old enough to run for president. But uh, it's more than anecdotal to look at the examples that have been floated. Where yes, the push is on, and if there's any one one of several good things that have come out of the COVID epidemic uh, and the at home learning is that it's woke a lot of people up with regard to because you know the parents now are like able to see the classroom sessions they're able to see what their kids are being taught or which ideology is being floated and a lot of parents are pretty shocked by it and i think it was pretty telling again not suggesting that all teachers are like this not suggesting that it is even necessarily systematic or that there's any conspiracy behind any of this. But I think it was Mm -hmm. very telling that a number of people on the far left who were involved in education expressed apprehension about at-home learning. They experienced a lot of apprehension about it. And their specific reason that was given in a number of well-publicized viral tweets uh, was the fact that there's there's no way that I'm paraphrasing, but basically there's no way to place limits on how much the parents are keeping an eye on what we're teaching their kids. 
in other words we're busted we're teaching some we're teaching some way indefensible shit and the parents are not going to dig it and they're going to be watching our classrooms so how do we how do we keep getting the message across i mean when you're when you're looking at, at shit as flawed as the, the 1619 project being actually adopted into high school curriculums i mean come on at this point can, can we just not pretend anymore i mean I have a copy of Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States on my shelf at home, too. I've read through it thoroughly, you know, when I want that particular historical slant on an issue that I'm trying to present a case about. Zinn did some great work, but to act as if that were some unbiased piece of historical research is utterly false and absurd to even make a claim like that. Uh, Zinn is far and away above anything that was generated by this crowd that's pushing the 1619 project there is a deliberate slant and i will be the first to own my leanings and my biases plural i'll be the first to own it because once upon a time i was a right-leaning libertarian i don't feel like i've moved that much i feel like the vin the whole uh the, the whole Overton window has fucking shifted around me, but looking at the extremes that I'm seeing come out of the American left right now, I wouldn't go so far as to say frightened um, because I don't scare easily, but I'm certainly deeply concerned um, because the things that they are pushing for, Again, it will all be done in the name of our hearts are in the right place. Uh, our motivations are pure. We are trying to make everyone more equal. We're trying to make everyone, you know, more this, more that. Insert euphemism of your choice here. And it's all done for the sake of advancing, our, you know, and it, we're, we're progressive. Right. Our cause is the noble love and theirs is, is evil. Our, sure. our, yeah, ours is messianic. Theirs <laughs> is Mephistophelian. Let's get a palate cleansing. Uh, are the frogs turning gay? Well, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, these you know, the thing is, we can talk about this on a podcast all day long, but it's meaningless. See, <laughs> we can talk about AOC and we can talk about the Green Green New Deal, but ultimately, the relevant point is that they're putting stuff in the water and it's turning the freaking frogs gay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, He's been waiting. I read about this He's thing been with mosquitoes do. that they're doing. Yeah. And they're like making them so that they won't mate because only uh, females carry the disease or something. You know, it's like, <laughs> they're like genetically modifying the mosquitoes. My joke was the, they're implanting red hats so that they destroy the colonies within or, you know. That's pretty close. So that's, that's, that's probably gonna silly be a joke, keeper. but. Uh, so just to, just to go out on. And you know Alex Jones too, right? I do. And your friends. You know Alex, I wouldn't go so far as to say friends, but well, we've, okay. we've hung out. You're, Damn, you're dropping an earpiece. <laughs> We uh we've hung out well, on I a number of something occasions. Something small and white, but I'm not sure it's the earpiece. Oh well, if it's <laughs> small and white, then definitely. Um, You're the understudy for Alex Jones. Yeah, pretty much. I was his backup singer. You know, <laughs> he had the you know, uh, he was out there doing the Tina Turner thing, and I'm just quietly in the back playing the bass. Frame rolling on a river. Uh, no, but I've hung out with Alex on a number of occasions. Rogan too as well i've gotten to hang out with him at a few ufc after parties in the green room a couple of times down in houston uh anyway bringing it home uh as far as predictions because i think i'm i'm buttoned yeah, up I think on, that's how I'm, we should uh end yeah, it, yeah. button up on a button up on a time limit here um i already gave you what i think would happen should biden win the election here's my prediction what will happen how it's act here's yeah, yeah. my prediction for how it's actually gonna roll on election night uh, I believe that Trump is going to win. I won't use the term landslide, A, because it's cliched, and B, because I think it's all played out and it's all relative in a matter of personal perspective anyway. What I will say is that Trump is going to win. Uh, not only will he win, but he will win by larger margins than he did in 2016. He will take more states in the Electoral College and he will win the national popular vote. At which point, the Democrats will contest, as they've said. It, at the same time, they're, they keep shaking their fist at Trump about you have to promise a peaceful transition and, and, and all these other things. They have said flat out that they will not concede under any circumstances. So 
you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, I suppose. Anyway, Alex Jones said 89 days of hell. Yes. <laughs> they're going to um, they're going to contest it. Um, it's going to get ugly. Ultimately, we'll go to the courts. And that is the thing about Barrett being on the Supreme Court now. Even if she doesn't wind up being the deciding vote, it'll be one more thing that they can point out and say stolen election. Um, Trump will win by those large margins. And then the first objection will be, no, we have to wait for all the mail-in ballots to come in, at which point there will be, and, you know, people can, oh, there's no evidence of voter fraud, whatever. I'm, I'm calling it right now that uh, after election night, they're going to keep finding uh, or ballot harvesting, whatever, finding these votes that are somehow miraculously going to go all 90 to 95 percent for Joe Biden. Um, they're going to do whatever they can. But where they've already fucked up is they front loaded. The Democrats are voting in historical numbers by mail. They're voting in historical numbers. And what are they doing? They're voting early. So all of the mail in ballots, it's all front loaded. They've got massive leads right now. But when Trump takes it on election night, that leaves them a lot less wiggle room on the back end to say, hey, we have to wait for all the mail-in ballots to come in. They can stretch it out for a week. They might be able to stretch it out for a month. But ultimately, the courts are going to intervene. They're going to say enough is enough. You've had all this time. We've looked at the numbers. There's no fucking possible way you can win. Trump takes the White House, at which point the organic protests that happened all on their own because of a completely spontaneous outrage by the electorate uh, is going to take to the streets again. And we're going to see riots in every major city in the United States. Um, is this I, why you told me to buy a gun? And if I don't use it in a year, you'll buy it back. Yeah, that's exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. I told him that I told him, I said, buy a gun, buy a Glock 19. If you don't wind up using it, well, if you don't wind up using it, I'll buy it back from you in a year. Um, but yeah, you're, you're going to get riots. You're going to get, uh, don't shoot get, me just to get to use it. <laughs> yeah, you're you're going to get, you're, I got to use this. So. Yeah. You're going to get all sorts of nastiness going on. Um, and either way going forward, I think we get authoritarianism out of this. Uh, and that is the saddest so part. Trump doesn't fear re-election. That he is sends in national guard without necessarily asking the governors. Well, you know, since once, once he has won the election, he doesn't have to worry about it. Right. He's a lame duck and he can just say, fuck it. I, I don't care. Right. Uh, he can call in the insurrection act. And of course that's going to make things infinitely worse. Let me go on record uh, as being absolutely and unequivocally opposed to him uh, uh, calling in the the uh, insurrection act to deal with these protests it needs to be dealt with on a state and a local level um at the very least if he wanted to be nice he could just say you know what i'm just gonna look the other way you guys got a week sort it out <laughs> that would make me happy but <laughs> again in the long run ultimately we get authoritarianism out of this uh trump is going to be whether he's willing or unwilling no matter how you feel about him on a personal level he is going to be put in a position where he is going to have to employ something like the insurrection act to be able to reestablish order that's assuming that i am correct if i'm incorrect and joe biden wins uh you're still going to get authoritarianism out of it because there will be an unholy vengeance who's president in uh <clears throat> 2024 2024 good question is there still president or is it <laughs> that's a good question again with authoritarianism going down the road who even knows so that's sort of the uh if biden's yeah. elected you're going to be looking at the equivalent of a of we might a... have to do just a separate COVID 19 <laughs> podcast but uh, yeah yeah definitely but you're... so i think joe i think lockdowns and mass scores those i mean someone i think they were <clears throat> like saying like how long does that last and then they're like well almost never because the virus right. is almost never going away now right, right right yeah we'll do a separate one on that but again going forward authoritarianism either way and if biden wins you're going to be looking at the equivalent of a stalinist Someone has purge to a stalinist purge i'm calling it right now it's going to be a stalinist purge of the maga crowd there's going to be an unholy vengeance behind this shit because we had the temerity to tell uh we had the temerity to tell the power structure as it exists uh, that we were going to vote how we wanted, as opposed to the way that they had ordered us to. 
uh, they will never forgive. They will never forgive the American public for their queen of the harpies not get, getting her coronation. They will never let that go, ever. So it's a matter of whether or not they seize power now or whether they hamper Trump to the point where they might as well have seized power, but they're never going to let that go. Either way, rolling forward, we get authoritarianism. That's my prediction. Ooh, 